Liverpool docks, for many people, the starting point for a holiday in the Isle of Man. The Island Steam Packet Company was established in 1831. Its ships still dock here regularly. On this occasion in 1961, the King Ori was in use across the Irish Sea to Douglas, approximately a three and a half hour journey. The flagship of the fleet, the Lady of Man, awaits its next duty. 1993, the Isle of Man Year of Railways, another King Ori arrives at Douglas. The current vessel carrying the historic name was built in 1975. This particular sailing was full of railway enthusiasts eagerly anticipating the discovery or rediscovery of the unique Manx Railways. This program is a study of the railways during the last 60 years. The delights of 1937, 1961, 1968 and 1993. In the 1890s and early 1900s, the Isle of Man was at the centre of a holiday boom. Douglas was transformed to provide accommodation and amenities for the thousands of visitors. A combination of financial investors and local entrepreneurs resulted in the creation of a unique transport network. Rail transport for the general public was first introduced in 1873. By 1880, Douglas, Peel, Port Erin and Ramsey were served by the Iron Horse. Meanwhile, the four-legged variety was proceeding along the promenade of Douglas. Even in 1937, the cameraman considered the horse trams to be quaint. The modernization of transport between the 1930s and 1960s apparently bypassed the Isle of Man completely. The elimination of first the horse, then the electric tram on the mainland, just didn't happen here. Gradually, a Cinderella atmosphere has evolved. However, even here, there have been a number of casualties. The greatest survivor is arguably the Manx Electric Railway. Its roots go back to 1893, when construction began of the line from Douglas to Groudle. At the turn of the century, Douglas was served by four tramways. The MER, the Douglas Bay Tramway, the Upper Douglas Cable Tramway, and the Douglas Southern Electric Tramway. Inside the Corporation Museum at Derby Castle is the only remaining vehicle from the Upper Douglas Cable Tramway. Restored from garden shed condition, numbers 72 and 73, an amalgamation of the two vehicles, occasionally proceeds along the prom propelled by a road vehicle. The tramway once started beside the Jubilee Clock and continued up Prospect Hill. A section of rail has been installed near the former terminus. A cable ran continuously beneath the street, cars gripping or releasing the moving cable to start or stop. By 1929, the system was worn out and buses replaced the trams. The Douglas Southern Electric Tramway was introduced in the same year, 1896. The only remaining vehicle from this system now resides at Kreisch Tramway Museum in Derbyshire. Sixteen vehicles worked the line. Only the first six were powered. The 500 volt overhead wires could almost be touched by passengers on the upper deck. The vehicles were one-sided. Passengers entered and alighted the car on the seaward side. The northern terminus was at Douglas Head, at the time very fashionable. From here, a funicular was provided to the Douglas Head Hotel and the tram terminus. This is the same location in September 1938. The Douglas Head Incline Railway was four foot gauge and ran between 1900 and 1954. Competition from bus services led to both the demise of the railway and the ferry service which served it. At the top of the hill is the impressive entrance to Marine Drive. In 1961, wires were still visible in the arches. From here, the tramway continued for three miles to Port Soderick. 
the 256 feet Walbury viaduct has disappeared. Closure came with the outbreak of war. Eventually, the route was taken over by the neighboring road. Standard gauge lines were eliminated from the Isle of Man. A short walk from the tramway terminus led to Port Soderick Beach, 180 feet below. In 1898, the short walk was shortened. A four-foot gauge funicular was introduced. The Port Soderick Holiday Beach lift was closed in 1939 along with the neighbouring tramway. The beach lift had previously operated in Douglas as the Falcon Cliff Lift. This 1927 five-foot gauge version operated until the 1990s but has now fallen into disuse. Its future is uncertain. In Switzerland Road, Douglas, another unusual lift operated. The ornate gateway was the entrance to the Douglas Holiday Camp escalator. This remarkable up-only electric stair was built in 1920 to serve Cunningham Camp. An electric motor powered a chain-link belt complete with fixed seats. The escalator remains largely intact, unused since 1968. The final local rail system which has disappeared from the area was built to serve the expanding tourist industry, but it never carried a single holidaymaker. The 300 million gallon West Baldwin Reservoir was built between 1900 and 1904 to supply fresh water to Douglas, six miles away. Ardwallin was among the locomotives used on the three-foot gauge railway. Sadly, the original plan to use the five-mile construction line as a passenger railway never came to fruition. By 1905, the line was completely lifted. The three-foot gauge steam passenger network started at Douglas Station, home of the Isle of Man Railway Company. These scenes were recorded by the late L. T. Catchpole in 1937. At this time, the railway boasted 46 route miles and a stud of 16 steam locomotives. 13 coach trains were regular features of summer operations, but winter services were very poorly patronized. The locomotive shunting is Derby, one of three engines built by Bayer Peacock for the opening of the line to Peel. In the yard is a selection of rolling stock. At its peak, the company used around 175 goods wagons. Freight included coal, vegetables, bagged lime, fertilizer, cattle, timber, and goods in association with the brewery in Castletown and mines in Foxdale. Mona, Kissack, Maitland, and Manin, the newest locomotive, are in steam. Although industrial railway systems on the island predate the turn of the century, the first passenger railway was opened on the island in 1873. Douglas and Peel were connected by the Isle of Man Railway Company. The following year, the same company completed the line to Port Erin. In 1880, the Manx Northern Railway opened from St John's to Ramsey. Six years later, Foxdale was connected to the system. By 1961, the system was in decline. The preceding winter months had seen closure of the St. John's to Peel line. The winter of 61 would bring about the closure of St. John's to Ramsey route. Two island platforms were used, one for the northern lines to Peel and Ramsey, the other was for the south line serving Castletown and Port Erin. Winter closures became standard practice, but total closure followed in 1966. No trains ran. 1967 saw a brief revival, but the 70s were traumatic. Nationalization was the savior.
G. H. Wood and Maitland emerged from Douglas Shed in 1993. Number 10 had just been returned to service. The finishing touch is the dome. Meanwhile, in Port Erin, number 12 is prepared for the first up service of the day, the 1015 Port Erin to Douglas. Driver Jeff Kelly and fireman Selwyn Rees Morgan are on duty. On this occasion, four locomotives were in steam on one day. Hutchinson and Maitland were booked for the service trains, G. H. Wood was on a special charter, and Loch was outstationed at Laxey for another special duty. We return to Douglas. G. H. Wood departs on the 0930 special to Castletown. Number 10 returned to service courtesy of sister engine Kissack. Number 13 was withdrawn in 1992, but its boiler now powers G. H. Wood. The train heads for Port Erin in 1968, the last year of the Peel and Ramsey lines. The northern and southern routes ran in parallel for approximately one mile from the station. Trains would often run in parallel. In the 1930s, our photographer took the opportunity to film Douglas from the Peel train. Manning climbs past Nunnery Bridge. Heavy trains such as this were often banked up the 1 in 65 Nunnery Bank. One of the 1873 engines assists. Maitland continues the climb through Oak Hill Cutting. We join the crew as the summit is conquered, 200 feet above sea level. Selwyn nurses the fire in preparation for another climb from Port Soderick. Port Soderick was very popular in Victorian days. The top and tail train seen in our 1930s footage would almost certainly have terminated here. We rejoin the train in 1968 for a trip through Santon to Balasala, one of the principal passing places on the 15 and a half mile line from Douglas to Port Erin. The upstation building has now disappeared. The driver of our locomotive, Hutchinson, delivers the DIY supplies and exchanges staff. Twenty-five years later, 10, 11 and 12 grace Balasala at the same time. 
the mechanical crossing gates protect the railway as it passes over the main Douglas to Castletown Road. Twelve other road crossings are protected by crossing keepers between Santon and Port Erin. Maitland continues south. At Castletown, once the capital of the island, the station master drops the peg for Hutchinson to arrive from Port Erin. An unusual shunt is about to be performed. Number four, Loch, has just arrived on a special charter from Douglas and will top and tail number 12 back to Douglas. Twenty-five years earlier, we approach Castletown from the north. Awaiting departure to Douglas is the pair of ex-County Donegal diesel rail cars. These were purchased in 1961, when the railway was desperate to restrain escalating running costs. Numbers 19 and 20 were purchased during a steam locomotive crisis. Colby is the next principal station. During the 1960s, the original building, dating from 1874, was still in use. However, this was replaced by the station building from Braddon Halt on the Peel Line. Port St Mary is the penultimate station, less than a mile from Port Erin. A fourth-class wooden shelter was originally provided here. Hutchinson departs. Port Erin, number 12 runs round its train in readiness for the return to Douglas. The original station was a few yards to the north. The present brick building was built in 1905. During 1914, the platforms were extended to handle double-headed 14-coach trains. Unfortunately, that era is over. However, the station retains much of its character. Alongside is the Railway Museum, now home for engine number one, Sutherland. Named after the Duke of Sutherland, chairman of the railway in its early years, the locomotive was one of three purchased to work the Douglas to Peel line upon opening in 1873. Engine number two, Derby, was dismantled in 1951. It is the only Isle of Man Railway Company engine to be lost in history. Number three, Panda, has returned home. Built in Manchester by Bayer Peacock, the engine now resides in the Museum of Science and Industry in the city. The locomotive is now a sectionalized exhibit. It was removed from the island in 1978. Number four is Loch one of four locomotives in action during 1993. Built in 1874, this engine was one of two delivered to work the Douglas to Port Erin line. The other was Mona. Number five, Mona, is one of three complete locomotives owned by the Isle of Man Society. Eight and nine are the others. The engine awaits restoration in the carriage shed at Douglas. Alongside Mona is Peveril, 
owned by the railway company. Number 7, Tinwald, was dismantled in 1946. Today, the frames of the engine are on display at Castletown Station. Fenella, number 8, is expected to be the next locomotive to return to steam. During the year of railways, the boiler was under repair at the Seven Valley Railway. Number 9, Douglas, is in store at Port Erin. This locomotive completed the fleet of engines until the Manx Northern was absorbed in 1905. The delivery of number 10, G. H. Wood, brought a new standard design to the island. Four of these larger engines entered service. G. H. Wood is in the current steam fleet. Number 11, Maitland, was delivered in 1905 with G. H. Wood. The locomotive has become something of a stalwart, rarely out of service. Hutchinson is number 12, delivered in 1908, the only locomotive to carry a blue livery. Number 13 is Kissack. The engine was in use into the 1990s. However, it has since become a donor locomotive and is unlikely to steam again until at least 1995. Number 14, Thornhill, was in fact a former Manx Northern locomotive. The engine was removed from Douglas for private preservation on the island. Two former Manx Northern locomotives were scrapped. Number 1 in 1923 and this locomotive in 1912. Number 15 was unique. Caledonia was the only six-coupled locomotive on the two railways. Dubs of Glasgow supplied the engine as Manx Northern Railway No. 4. It now resides in Port Erin Museum alongside No. 16. Manin was delivered in 1926. It was purchased to haul even the heaviest trains up Port Soderick Bank unassisted. The arrival of the railway at Port Erin in 1874 was not a first. Railways first came to the island in the 18th century. Inside North Bradder lead mines, two-foot gauge wooden rails still remain. On the other side of the bay, the first steam locomotive on the island was used on the Port Erin Breakwater Railway. At low tide, the remains of this scheme, washed away in 1881, are still visible. The workshops still stand. From here, the seven-foot gauge line ran to a quarry. The broad gauge engine was named after Governor Loch. We return to the station to see the other Loch and Maitland depart for Douglas. The railway is a real survivor. Threatened with extinction throughout the 1960s, 1975 saw services restricted to just a five and a half mile run from Port Erin. Thankfully, the Manx government paid a quarter of a million pounds for the route. The Victorian Steam Railway was saved. The Port Erin line survived, but the Peel, Foxdale and Ramsey routes were not so lucky. Hutchinson arrives at Douglas with a train from Peel during the Lord Ailsa period. In September 1965, the Isle of Man Railway Company announced the winter closure of the Ramsey Line. Within two months, the Peel and Port Erin routes were stopped for track repairs.
Eventually, the company admitted that it was seeking to abandon rail travel. William Lambden, the new company manager, apparently preferred buses. Like a phoenix from the flames, steam returned to Douglas on the 3rd of June, 1967. Mona, Fenella, G. H. Wood, Maitland, Hutchinson, Caledonia and the County Donegal Diesels returned to service. The Marquis of Ailsa had come to the rescue. A 21-year lease had been agreed with the railway company. Peel and Ramsey were visited in the first two days. A few weeks later, Castletown rejoined the network. The steam engines were repainted from red into a new livery to signal the new era. This train heads for Peel. The line in the foreground is to Port Erin. A short distance to the south, the Peel and Ramsey line diverges from the Port Erin route. A doubleheader approaches Douglas. The last train of the day was often double-headed. In 1973, all railway land out of use was acquired by Tinwald. The Peel and Ramsey lines were lifted and sold for scrap. Today, the Peel line is now a footpath. Trains last called here on the 7th of September, 1968. Approaching from Peel in 1937, we arrive at the Grade 5 station. Minimum facilities were provided. A considerable amount of work has been undertaken to open the Peel line as a footpath. New decking has made the River Dew Bridge at Union Mills safe for walkers. We continue west. The next station was Crosby. The diesel rail cars were regularly used on school services on the Peel line, the hard gradients of the Port Soderick route proving difficult. At St John's, Caledonia. Manin, Peveril, Sutherland and Thornhill were on display. During the Lord Ailsa period, the out-of-use locomotives were repainted by the newly formed Isle of Man Steam Railway Supporters Association. Each morning and evening, a locomotive, on this occasion Mona, would shunt the dead engines in or out of the carriage shed. St John's was an important junction giving access to Peel and the Manx Northern Railway lines to Ramsey and Foxdale. G. H. Wood arrives with a train from Peel. This will shunt onto the train which has already arrived from Ramsey, couple up, then continue to Douglas. Trains arriving from Douglas would complete the opposite manoeuvre. The train would be split into two portions. A potential race was then on the carts on the parallel tracks to the west. Approaching St John's, down the 1 in 49, is the train from Foxdale. This line closed in 1940. A single coach was usual. The line was principally built for freight traffic. Manin arrives from Douglas on the 5th of July, 1937. The shunting of trains here would often lead to amazing activity, but on Tinwald Day, things just went bananas. The challenge for the railway was to get everyone to the church on time. Literally thousands of people wanted to get to St. John's for 11 a.m. Something of a logistics problem. Trains were consequently rather long and top and tailed. The carriage of passengers in cattle wagons on Tinwald Day wasn't unknown. Even the storage of stock could present problems. Business was booming. Even the Foxdale line was busy. In this view, the Foxdale line is visible in the distance. A bridge crosses the Douglas to Peel line just east of St John's Station. Heavy traffic, but not for much longer. Another three years and Foxdale services would be axed. Foxdale is two and three quarter miles south of St John's. 
The Foxtail Railway had been formed by the Manx Northern Railway directors to provide a direct link to the largest lead mines in Britain. Unfortunately, by the time the route was built, the Isle of Man Mining Company was in recession. The mines closed in 1911. We depart St John's and head for Peel. This is now part of the Peel Line Steam Heritage Trail. Just to the south of Glen Farber Mill, an old railway bridge marks a former junction. Although not immediately obvious, a branch line diverged here, trailing in to join the Peel Line. Continuing through the undergrowth, you will reach the River Neb. Do not be fooled. This bridge is not the former railway bridge. The course of the river has been changed. The location of the original bridge is approximately a hundred yards to the south. The line ran between 1915 and 1919 to serve the Nokalo camp, an internment centre for approximately 23,000 alien citizens. Caledonia was the regular engine, outstationed at Peel. The larger locomotive was preferred on the heavily graded line. Today little remains, but the engine shed can still be found. After the war, a 15-inch gauge line was installed here to serve Nokalo Farm. Back on the main line, we are now passing Glenfarber en route to Peel. Thirty-one years later, we arrive at the terminus. The first public steam passenger service arrived here on the 1st of July, 1873. The board on the buffer beam indicates to crossing keepers and signalmen that another train will follow in the same direction. These scenes were recorded in August 1968. The services to Peel and Ramsey were both suspended on the 7th of September. Today, much of the original infrastructure survives. In addition to the water tower, the goods shed, now home for a Viking longboat replica, and station building still stand. But there was more than one railway in Peel. Compare and contrast 55 years earlier. The Peel Brickworks Flangeway once operated here. L.T. Catchpole recorded these scenes during a family holiday. The line in the foreground is the Isle of Man Railway Company route from Douglas to Peel. A loaded wagon is hauled from the quarry to the brickworks. The brickwork buildings were largely demolished in the 1990s during the building of a new power station. The empty wagon returns. In addition to these lines, Peel Quay once had a construction railway on the western side and the internment extension on the east. Today, the brickworks quarry is filled with water. The demolition of the bridge across the River Neb has created an isolated bird sanctuary. This is the scene in 1938. L.T. Catchpole positioned himself high above the quarry workings, looking towards Peel. The concrete structure in the previous view was the base for these buildings. The earliest railway in the city was the Corrins Hill or Peel Hill Tramway, which ran from Contrary Head, southwest of Peel. Stone was hauled from a quarry up a steep incline. Dating back to the early 1860s, this is believed to be the island's first surface railway. A steam engine was almost certainly introduced at a later date. A level section followed, the three-foot gauge route hugging the coastline towards Peel Hill. The track bed is clearly visible. Another incline lowered the loaded wagons into Peel. Returning to St John's, we are now approaching from the east. The photographer is on a special excursion from Douglas. The train engine, Kisak, 
has been removed for watering at the east end of the station before heading for Ramsey along the former Manx Northern line. Interestingly, the train uses the loop line. Peel, Douglas and Ramsey trains prepare to depart. St John's had once boasted the only station footbridge on the island. A turntable was also provided. The Ramsey and Peel lines ran in parallel for half a mile before the Manx northern route curved away to the north. Glen Moore and Glen Willin viaducts were the principal engineering structures on the line. We are now approaching Kirk Michael. Trains often terminated here during the boom years. Glen Willin was purchased by the railway in 1935. A footpath gave access from the station and numerous attractions entertained the tourists. In 1938, Fenella arrives from Ramsey. The railway station has become a fire station. Much of the route is still walkable. At Balavolley, between Ballo and Salby Glen, a siding once branched off along this embankment. A quarry line, active between 1882 and 1893, joined at reception sidings. At Quarry Bends, an incline crossed the road and continued to Clark's Quarry. Manx Northern Rails survive outside the Wildlife Park. During the Lord Ailsa period, a halt was opened here. It is now home for the island's newest railway. Peveril is watered. The five-inch gauge engine was built by Mike Casey and is often used on the line. Loch is just visiting from the mainland. Three gauges are available. Three and a half inch, five inch and seven and a quarter inch. During our visit, the Orchid Line restaged a simultaneous departure from St. John's. Loch heads for Ramsey, Peveril for Peel. During the Lord Ailsa period, a number of innovative ideas were tried to stimulate revenue. Maitland is seen near Milntown with one of the short-lived freight experiments. Three road tankers were converted to carry oil from Ramsey to the power station at Milntown. Sadly, this service and the Mantainer, a container service to Castletown, fell by the wayside. Milne Town was approximately half a mile from the terminus at Ramsey. At Ramsey, a Manx Northern fish-tailed home signal protects the station. This was the headquarters of the Manx Northern Railway. Locomotives Ramsey, Northern, Thornhill and Caledonia were once serviced here. After the takeover by the Isle of Man Railway Company in 1905, the two sharp Stewart engines were considered to be non-standard and were eventually withdrawn. A branch was built to the harbour. Coal and grain was the principal traffic, although goods for Foxdale was one of the original priorities. Closure in 1968 was followed by track lifting in 1975. Today, it's hard to believe there was ever a railway in Ramsey. At the northern end of the promenade at Douglas is Derby Castle. This is the terminus for two separate three-foot gauge tram systems. From here, the Manx Electric Railway heads north to Laxey and Ramsey, and the Douglas Corporation horse trams 
head south along the promenade. The terminus is effectively a transport interchange. In 1961, passengers arriving from the north on the MER continue their journey behind horsepower. Sadly, the ornate canopy built by the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Company was demolished in 1980. Thomas Lightfoot, a retired civil engineer from Sheffield, opened the horse tramway in 1876. Six years later, the line was sold to the Isle of Man Tramways Limited, who did much to improve the service. In 1894, the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Company took over, but their reign was short. The collapse of Dumbbells Bank resulted in the liquidation of the company which included the Douglas Bay Tramway, the horse trams, the Upper Douglas Tramway, the cable route, and the coastal electric route from Douglas to Ramsey. The corporation purchased the horse trams in 1902 along with the Upper Douglas Tramway for £50,000. The system had evolved from single-track route during its formative years to a 1.6-mile double track complete with 36 tram cars and 68 horses. During the 1960s, the corporation's buses also used the location. An AEC regent completes a tricky manoeuvre. Even life with the corporation has been difficult. In 1926, motor buses were introduced along the prom, and the following year, there was to be no winter tram service for the first time. In the late 1940s, the future of the trams was still in doubt. Open-top buses were suggested. It was not until the early 1960s that Tinwald recognized the tramway as something special. This realization has thankfully resulted in the survival of the route today. Tinwald Day 1963 was a special occasion. Tram number 44 became the Royal Tram when Her Majesty the Queen Mother visited the town. A royal crest is carried. Thirty years after the event, Sonny arrives at Derby Castle from the stables fresh for duty. The stables are located approximately 200 yards from the terminus. Michael Krellin, stable foreman, gives an insight to the operation of the stables today. In the heyday, they had roughly about 100 horses running here throughout the season. Unfortunately, the decline in the tourism trade over here has meant the decline in the number of horses used in the stables. And instead of using all the stables now, we only use part of them. When we had 100 horses, there was two stables. Uh, one just down the road, which is now a flower garden. The other one, which is this one. The horses are trained or broken in at four year old, and they go on till their late teens, till they're retired, up to the home of rest for old horses on the island. The present number of horses we have is 39 working horses. There is a rotor prepared daily to give each horse to each driver. In any one day, at the present, we're using 19 horses for our four trams. They do a two-hour shift, and the two-hour shift consists of three laps, lap there and back of the promenade is a lap, and that takes 40 minutes. The first tram goes on the promenade at 9.20 in the morning, and then there's a 10-minute service after that till 8.50 at night when the last tram comes in. Trams terminate a few yards short of the sea terminal, but this was not always the case. In 1961, work was in progress to realign the route and build a new southern terminus to serve the forthcoming sea terminal. These scenes 
are from the opening ceremony. Unfortunately, the terminus was only used for a short time. The Douglas taxi drivers claimed they were losing too much trade. Thelma was on duty. We now return to Derby Castle along Loch and Harris promenades. Although over 50 cars have been used on the horse tramway, only 23 vehicles survive in 1993. The Royal Tram passes. This was one of a pair of toast tracks delivered in 1907. In inclement weather, the saloons are pressed into service. This is number 18. And so is this. Number 18 was one of six double-deckers purchased from South Shields in 1887. Conversion to a single-deck saloon came in the early 1900s. During the late 1980s, the tram returned to double-deck status. We continue our journey on the Manx Electric Railway. The booking office at Derby Castle is in typical MER style. Sadly, other associated buildings have been lost and the prices have gone up. These views are at Derby Castle in 1961, before the construction of Summerland. A winter saloon arrives from the north before running round a crossbench trailer. Remarkably, the original stock purchased to work the line still operates today. The wagons served the post office. Unfortunately, the winter closure in 1975 led to the loss of the contract. Number 7 of 1894 pushes a trailer onto the depot. This was the site of the original power station and car depot. Buildings were simply added as the line was extended and the tramway's popularity increased. Inside, a variety of stock awaits its next duty including one of the original 1893 trailers. 25 years later, car number 26 moves off shed. This was one of four trailers supplied by Milnes in 1898. All were modified in 1905 by the MER to become power cars. Three of these crossbench opens survive. In 1893, the tramway opened as far as Groudel. Laxey was reached in July 1894. Snaefell Summit in 1895, and Ramsey in 1899. The recently demolished Douglas Bay Hotel was served by the railway in more ways than one. Not only was the hotel on the route to Groudel, but it was the first customer for electricity. The tramway company's power station eventually lit Douglas Promenade. Not only did the Isle of Man have a modern electric tramway before London and Birmingham, but it boasted electric street lighting too. Onken was reached after a hard climb at 1 in 24. The vehicle here returns to Derby Castle. It sports the unpopular nationalised livery. Housedrake Camp was the principal reason for the construction of the tramway. The section between Derby Castle and Groudel had been instigated by Alexander Bruce, head of the Dumbbells Banking Company Limited, to serve Housedrake. At Housedrake, a large-scale housing development and pleasure gardens were envisaged. A toll road running parallel was also constructed. The terminus would be two and a half miles north of Derby Castle at Groudel. From three foot to two foot gauge, a short walk from the Manx Electric Station is the Groudel Glen Railway. Sea Lion departs for Sea Lion Rocks.
56 years earlier, Polar Bear departs. Doomed in 1962, the railway is now run by a team of enthusiasts led by Tony Beard. The story of Gradle Glen began in 1893 when a local businessman saw the potential of a tourist attraction here. And the first thing he did was actually build a series of paths leading out to a beach in a coastal headland where he built a zoo where there were sea lions and polar bears. In 1896, he provided another attraction and that was the building of this two-foot gauge railway and purchased two engines from Bagnalls in Stafford and appropriately named them Sea Lion, which is the locomotive behind me, and Polar Bear. And these continued operating the railway until 1939 on the outbreak of the war. In 1950, they managed to get the trains running again, but only for a short section onto the headland. But 1962 proved to be the very last year. And the railway was then dismantled, the tracks removed, and it wasn't until 1982 that a bunch of volunteers decided to recreate this railway and to put it back as a tourist attraction. And in 1986, we managed to start running trains for the very first time. By luck and being in the right place at the right time, we managed to send Sea Lion, the, well, the derelict remains of her, off to BNFL in Sellafield in Cumbria. And over a two and a half year restoration program, she was restored to working order and came back here in September 1987. The route is stunning. A hard climb through the tree-lined glen precedes the headland section. The terminus at Sea Lion Rocks was reopened in 1992. Trains had been absent here for 53 years. The course of the track bed is now slightly further inland. Some of the original rails are still visible. Steam was threatened here in the 1920s. Battery electrics were introduced for six seasons before steam made a triumphant return. The remains of the zoo are still visible. This was the polar bear pit. Visitors could view the animals from a footbridge. Sea lions once performed here. We return to Len Cone with polar bear. Sea lion rounds the same curve. In the preserved railway scene, the line is almost unique, built to carry tourists from the middle of nowhere to the edge of it. The railway performs its original task well. How many other railways can claim to be true to their origins? We rejoin the Manx Electric for a trip to Lexi. Car number five was purchased for the opening of the Groudel to Lexi line. The extension was planned before Groudel had even been reached. On the 28th of July, 1894, the line was officially opened to a new terminus six and three quarter miles from Derby Castle. Descending into Laxey down the one in 24 is a winter saloon. Number 21 was delivered in 1899.
The village of Laxi is a popular destination for holidaymakers. One of the principal attractions is the Great Laxi Wheel, or Lady Isabella. Laxi was a mining community until 1930. The huge water wheel was built to drain lead mines which stretched for over a mile underground. The largest water wheel in the world is now fully restored. Visitors are invited to don a hard hat and experience the damp, cramped atmosphere of one of the mine addicts. A 19-inch gauge line ran from the mines along the north side of the River Laxey to Tiplers. From the washing floors, the goods were transferred to a three-foot gauge horse tramway for a trip to the harbour and eventual shipment. The harbour route was proposed as an extension to the Manx Electric. Bee and Ant. Two Stephen Lewin built locomotives served underground until closure of the mines. Even during the mines working years, the water wheel was an attraction to visitors. Between 1890 and 1910, the Laxey Wheel Incline Railway, or Browside Tramway, carried passengers from the village. The terminus is now a car park. Remarkably, the railway was actually powered by water from the tail race of the wheel. By the time L.T. Catchpole visited the village in 1937, the mines were closed and the Browside Tramway, built to serve the booming holiday industry, had proved to be unprofitable. The Manx Electric, however, was still bringing tourists to the village in their thousands. After the successful extension to Lexi, Alexander Bruce set his sights higher than ever, to 2,036 feet. The Snaefell Mountain Railway was constructed as an independent route, then sold on completion to the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Power Company for double the construction cost. The newly named company would only last approximately six years before overcommitment to Ramsey and the fall of Dumbbell's Bank led to liquidation. The company formed to rescue the coast route was named the Manx Electric Railway. Snaefell Mountain Railway No. 1 arrives at the interchange. The Snaefell Mountain Railway was Britain's first mountain railway. The first tram departs at 8.45 a.m. Passengers are the staff destined for the summit. departs for the summit 56 years earlier. At the bottom of the climb, an unusual point is set for a descending car. We continue to the summit with car number two. The line climbs on a ruling grade of one in 12. Like the neighboring Manx Electric, it was served by a 500 volt DC supply, but was built to a wider gauge. Three feet six inches was preferred to accommodate a center fell rail. The extra width would also be beneficial in high winds. Snaefell Summit is the highest point on the island. It may be a desirable destination on a nice day, but it can be very inhospitable. Construction began in late January 1895. Seven months later, the line was complete. Bungalow is the only intermediate station. Car number five arrives. In 1970, this vehicle caught fire at the summit and was burned down to the frames. A full rebuild has followed. The principal difference is the use of bus windows. The road is part of the TT course. 
during race days, trams terminate each side of the crossing. Passengers transfer via the footbridge. During the late 1970s, the six cars were fitted with new bogies, built by London Transport, and traction motors and control equipment from the Aachen system in Germany. The rheostatic braking equipment is now on the roof. The adverts have disappeared. Trams use the right-hand line. On this section, the overhead wires are removed each winter to avoid frost damage. Sadly, the original castle features of the Summit Hotel have now vanished. Even in the 1930s, you weren't guaranteed a good view. The fell break was essential for the descent. Number five departs the terminus. It is claimed that you can see six kingdoms from the summit. England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, man and heaven. Until the fitting of rheostatic braking, the controlled descent was a two-man job. The fell brake is applied. These brakes are positioned at the end of each car, gripping the rail upon application. Even today, the fell system is retained for emergencies. Car number two approaches the point for the depot. These scenes were recorded during an enthusiast's tour of the island. At the depot is the works car Maria. This vehicle would borrow bogies from a passenger car. Also resident are two Wickham rail cars used by the Civil Aviation Authority. The nationalized livery carried by this car was only applied between 1957 and 59. We return to the coast route aboard car number 22. Fire almost totally destroyed this vehicle in 1990. It is now the pride of the fleet. Local craftsmen rebuilt the vehicle to its former glory. Fire also engulfed the hotel at Dune Glen, but the station has seen little change in the last 60 years. A crossbench open passes on a departmental duty. A quarter of a mile to the north is Dune Quarry. Number 22 arrives from Laxey. From October 1895, Alexander Bruce leased quarries here originally to provide paving for the Douglas Cable Tramway. Special stock was utilized including locomotive number 23. Rail haulage ended in the 1930s. At Balagori, a winter saloon heads for Ramsey. Generally, the line was built to follow the lie of the land, but here major earthworks were required. Trams replaced steam on level crossing signs in the 1990s. This halt is typical of the MER. Few facilities were ever provided for passengers except at Derby Castle, Laxey and Ramsey. In the distance is Ramsey Pier. The tramway arrived on the outskirts of Ramsey in July 1898. Balure became the temporary terminus until bridge work was completed. Half a mile further north is Ramsey, nearly 18 miles from Derby Castle. Although the Manx Electric has suffered financial traumas throughout its history, the railway has remained faithful to tradition. Nationalization in 1957 offered less stability than one might expect. During 1976, the 10-mile section from Laxey to Ramsey wasn't even opened. Even so, after a hundred years of service, the MER is still going strong. 
Our last Manx line once ran along the now derelict Queen's Pier in Ramsey. The 2,300-foot pier was opened in 1886, complete with a three-foot gauge tramway. This Hibbard Planet petrol locomotive was purchased in 1937. In 1950, this Wickham rail car was added to the fleet. The line was built to carry passengers and their luggage to the waiting steamers. Initially, porters pushed wagons before the arrival of the planet. Closure of the pier came in 1981. Demolition is imminent. During 1993, the Isle of Man Railways embarked on a year of railways in conjunction with the centenary of the Manx Electric Railway. The number of events was simply illuminating. MER car number nine illustrates. This was the first time a Manx electric vehicle ever acted as an illuminated car. On several occasions, the varied Manx electric fleet was on display at Derby Castle. Stars of the show were car numbers one and two, built in 1893, the Centenarians. The other exhibits dispersed before the celebrities departed. Number six returns to the depot. Numbers one and two were purchased for the opening of the line to Groudel and carry their original livery. Appropriately, this unusual parallel running was only between Derby Castle and Groudel, the section of line celebrating its centenary. These are the oldest electric vehicles in regular service in the world. Nineteen ninety three also saw a return to service for Manx Electric Locomotive Number no. Twenty Three. Built in nineteen hundred by the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Power Company to haul heavy stone traffic, the locomotive was in a severe collision in nineteen fourteen. It was rebuilt in nineteen twenty five to this condition. But number no. twenty three would not be the only locomotive on the MER. Loch would also feature on a service from Laxey to Dune Quarry. Number four departs from Douglas Yard for another session outstationed at Laxey. MER depot became home for Loch for long periods during 1993. The Bear Peacock engine pushes trailers numbers 57 and 58 towards Laxey station in readiness for the 1045 service. This is not the first time an Isle of Man Railway Company engine has worked on the electric lines. During construction, Derby was used on the MER. After completing a run round in Laxey Station, Loch moved up to the steam terminus a little to the north.
Interestingly, this route was considered as a steam route long before the idea of an electric railway was generated. The hard gradients resulted in the idea being abandoned. The 1 in 38 to Menorca precedes a 1 in 24. Loch storms the bank. This section of line has caused numerous problems for the MER over the years. A landslide once threatened to close the Ramsey line completely. Number four approaches the summit above Bulgham Bay. On the steam railway, night steam was on the agenda. On this occasion, the event was run in conjunction with an Oakwood Press book launch. Loch and Maitland performed to the crowds, including staged departures. Double-headers were also a regular feature on service trains throughout the year. Maitland and Loch climb Nunnery Bank. On the 27th of June, G.H. Wood returned to service. This is the official first train climbing to Port Soderick. Another engine to return to steam was Polar Bear. The former Groudel Glen Bagnall is back. Return to steam at the Amberley Chalk Pits Museum, complete with a rake of rebuilt Groudel Glen coaches, the complete train would return to the island in August. This is the first official train.
The Isle of Man railways are incredibly varied, but one of the elements that truly delights is the friendly atmosphere. Regular Port Erin fireman Selwyn. I first came to the Isle of Man in 1973 for the Manx Grand Prix. I loved the island and eventually came here to live, and the railways become a way of life. Anyway, we'd better put the engine away now, so I look forward to seeing you in the Isle of Man.